Susan, my friend, welcome to the On Purpose podcast. And especially for you, I got to ask, how in the fuck are you today? I am so fucking awesome. You don't even know. <laughs> so fucking awesome. You know what's funny is I get compliments from people when we have guests that cuss more than other people. I, I don't know why that is for other persons. For myself, when I hear other people cuss, it just makes it feel like they're being genuine. Okay. They're not trying to put on this facade that I am oh. this professional and, and this is all you're getting. For me, it's just, I and mean, you know, it doesn't have to be all cussing all the time, but to hear people actually talk like a human being, I think that for me, that's what the appeal <laughs> is. So, but I am fucking awesome. I spent the weekend with a great friend of mine and just enjoyed my time with them, got it away from the office. And it was just, it was a great time. It's beautiful weather here in the Midwest where I'm at. So it was a beautiful drive home. So I am fucking phenomenal today. Oh, I love fucking and phenomenal in the same sentence. That's It's going to be a good hour together. I hope so. Yeah, I love it. And I, one of the things I really like doing is I prepare to bring guests on and to share their stories. I like to to thank you for what it is that brought you to my attention first. Okay. And, and Susan, I want to thank you for being someone that genuinely cares about other people. And what I mean by that and how I first came across you was, you started sharing our podcast with other people. And mm -hmm. I looked and you were sharing this podcast and another podcast and, and, and any information that you thought could help somebody you shared. And I wanted to commend you for that. Cause I think in today's world, especially in the social media area, it's so much of what can I do to get ahead for myself? And how can I boost my numbers that we don't oftentimes look out to help one another. So I just wanted to thank you for doing that and say, you know, if I can repay you in some way, I'll gladly do it. Oh, well, you're welcome. And honestly, you know, for a lot of what my career has been, and as a person, I, I sort of fell into it, is that I want to be this bridge between the people that have a need with the people that have the resources or the know-how. And the only way I can do that is to facilitate getting people connected in some way. And social media is phenomenal at doing such a thing. And I see all these wonderful podcasts out here that I can... I don't have enough time in the day. I run a full-time <laughs> practice on my own and I'm part of a collective and I have another project going and I have a personal life. And then on top of that, I got my own podcast. I don't have enough time in the day to cover the subjects that are out there. And for the interests that I have, especially for folks that either I counsel with or that I've been a part of, I want to make sure other voices are heard as well. And if I can do that just by boosting the signal a little bit, I'm happy to do it. And I think it just as a testament to your character and to your, quite honestly, your love for helping people find answers and not necessarily looking for credit for being the answer, but I just got to get you in touch with the right people. That's all I want to do. I mean, there's nothing in it for me. And I don't, I don't necessarily want anything to be in it for me other than what my grandmother used to say is that, you know, if you can help one person before you leave this earth, you've paid your rent for being right. here. And my grandmother helped finished raising me. Um, she was a big part of my life. And I took it to heart, you know, why be a shit when you can be a decent human being and just help one another out? I, that's, I thought the whole point of, I have a minor in world religious history and that's what religion is supposed to be about from what I've studied is it's supposed to be helping alleviate the human experience while we're here. Cause life can go sideways pretty quick. That's all I want to do. I love it. Well, you're doing a great job and it's an honor to have you on here and to share our or share your story with our community. And anytime I get to bring on somebody that's known as the sweary therapist and hosts a show <laughs> called fuck the rules, I'm intrigued. Like this just adds <laughs> more layers to it. But now Susan, before we get into the, the heavy yes. lifting here, I got to warm yes. you up. I like to okay. know some really important questions and more, more than just me, our community wants to know this kind of stuff. Okay, shoot. All right. You're stranded on a deserted island. You're eating one thing for the rest of your life. What will Susan be eating? It's not a food. It's actually spices. Um, ever since COVID messed up my nose and my oh, mouth. Yeah. Especially since then, I have been a big proponent about food flavorings. And spices can make just about anything taste good. And okay. so if that's what I'm going to have, I would like to have spices as my food for the one thing to have for the rest of my life. Cause I'll, I'll forge her in. I'll find something to eat. You know, this fat girl liked your taco, so I can find <laughs> anything to eat, but I want flavor to it. So I'm going to bring spices. That's what I would bring. 
All right. Does that count? Hey, it's your it's your island. Now I'm not saying I'm rushing to get to this island with you, to be honest <laughs> with you. There's a couple others that are doing like ribeyes and tacos and agave that I might hit on the way to get some spices. That's from perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. But you know what? I can make tacos and all that other good stuff mm. if I have the spices and I can go find the animals. <laughs> so it's fine. Fair I was play. a kid in the seventies and I was part of my grandparents' farm during the summers. Oh. I <clears throat> ain't nothing. You're ain't nothing. Resourceful. Yeah, that's right, damn it. All right, you get one superpower. What is your okay. power and what do you want to do with it? Mm. I want to take away people's hurt. I mean, like, I'm, and I'm not talking like as a therapist in alleviating the ability to live through life that's hard. I mean, I want, I want the ability to take the hurt actually away from the person so it doesn't so it doesn't even leave a scar on the soul. Mm. What about the lessons they learn that we learn going through pain though? Would you leave that? No, I didn't say I was going to take away the lesson. I want to take away the hurt because sometimes yeah. that hurt gets in the way and it's so painful. Mm. What, what is there to learn other than I fucking survived it? Okay. But that hurt, there's so many people that are carrying around this horrible hurt that gets in the way of being able to learn anything else about themselves. And I'm not saying that that's not valid. Sure. But there are people out there who should have never been hurt children right. innocent people i mean they're just there shouldn't be um that's that's what my superpower would be i think yeah i love it i love it favorite book you can't ask me that man because i am an avid reader since i was six so i have All right. so what's many your, books what's your go-to book that you reread when you're just in one of those moods you're like okay i need to get my 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 my, my flame relit oh my gosh Honestly, um, Leo Buscalia, he was a 70s and 80s instructor in California, and he wrote a book, Born to Love, and he talked about the human need for connection and how even during that time, we were, we were pulling further, further and further apart as human beings, and I don't know, I would... I would really, I always go back to Born to Love because even though it's it's outdated in some of the, the concepts and theories he had in there, sure. the baseline of we have this capacity to give and alleviate, again, hurt and loneliness in someone's life. That's why mm. I go back to it. Mm, that's a good one. All right. You get to have dinner with one person. They could still be with us or have passed on. Who would you have dinner with and what would you want to ask them? I'm going to be selfish and say my grandmother before Love she it. got Alzheimer's before yeah. she got Alzheimer's. I have so many more questions about her life and I only know probably a sliver of what she went through in her life. And I have so many questions I never got to ask her because Alzheimer took the last 20 years of her life. Oh, that was a long battle for her then 20 yeah, years. It was, it was slow for the first 10 years, but there were just pieces that started slipping away in the last 10 years were terrible. So that would yeah. be, I'm going to be selfish and say that's that's who I want to come back and have dinner with. I'd love it. I'd like to be there. Because now off the air, you were talking about, we we're talking about grandmothers. Mm -hmm. And what was it about your grandma? You said she finished raising you. What what was that relationship like for you? Um, She was the one that kept my brother and I off the streets, basically. Um, it was not good. My um, parents were divorced. It was It was all kinds of complicated, fucked up mess. And my grandmother was the one that kept us off the street. My aunt helped where she could, her daughter. And grandma just loved me, you know, especially when you didn't think anybody wanted you, especially when it's that kind of complication that your teenage brain doesn't have the ability to, to grasp some of these bigger abstract concepts about what's yeah. really happening in a human relationship, especially between your parents. And then yeah. the next thing you know, neither parent wants you. And then it's like, well, what are you going to do with this? And then you're a teenager, all those hormones going on anyway. You know, she she was courageous, man. She took on teenagers when she had already raised her family. And then she was part of my life and my biological daughter's life um, for a long time, as well as my aunt, her daughter again. So it's a very, it was a very close relationship. That's not to say the woman didn't drive me crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't frustrate the hell out of her, but yeah. I think when you have that kind of relationship, there's going to be those moments where you kind of get scratchy with one another, you know? Yeah. 
how old were you when this started happening? When you, you said she kept you mm, off the streets. 16, 17. Oh, such a tough age already. Yeah. And it was, it was bad at the beginning and it just, it was bad throughout my childhood and my young adult years. So she was, she, and again, my aunt um, were persons who were consistent and present yeah. when they needed to be. So mm. talk to me about consistent and present. That is, those are two terms that I think we need to focus more on in our own lives, right? Consistent mm -hmm. and being persistent. What would you say that's something you learned from them? Absolutely. The consistency of showing up when you say you're going to show up or making sure that you are present when you are with that person. And I think you're right. I think in this day and age, it's really easy. I mean, these cell phones are constructed to be these powerful machines, but the apps that we have on it are designed by teams of persons to pull our attention in their direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been recent studies over the last 10, 15 years about the shortness of the human attention span since the inception of the internet. And especially since we've devised these apps for these little mini computers we carry in our pockets. So being present with someone. I mean, we, I just had a conversation with my friend I visited and our phones were in our bags. We, we didn't pull them out at any point in time when we would go out to have dinner and we would have them off to the side when we were hanging out at her place, but they weren't like right here. You know, they were just off to the side and we'd have to go up and get them to go answer something or, or find, you know, something we were looking up online or whatever. Um, you know, when I go out to dinner with friends or my family, the cell phone is put off to the side it's or it's left in the bag because I'm there with them. And if it's important, they'll call and break through on my do not disturb because if they're on my line. Right. I'm sorry, my list of contacts. But otherwise, there's nothing they can't wait for half an hour or an hour. If it's that much of an emergency, they better be dialing 911. What do you think's the impact on us when, when, we, when we struggle with just being present where we are? Right. We're all we're, we're very seldom where we are anymore. Right. Like, even though I'm with you, I'm my mind's over here. I'm looking at my phone over there. I'm thinking of this. What What is the, the repercussion for not having time to just be present? You miss so much. First off, you miss talking to that person and seeing their facial expression and their body language and picking up on these social cues that as humans, we have an innate ability to be able to kind of read a room, most of us. Right. Um, you know, that being said, you know, there are certain components for neurodiversity and neurodivergent folks that it's really difficult for them because the way their brain is wired. But most of us need to be able to see one another. And while my podcasts are just audio, yeah, I always have the video up so that we can have a conversation and look at each other. It's not as good as when you're in person because you also pick up that energy. Yeah. But you still have that connection because you can I can read your face and I can see what's kind of going on for you and the way you think and and how your body language is. Maybe, you know, you're you're taken aback by something or you're really interested, you're leaning forward. You you get more information in the nonverbal that also emphasizes the said and unsaid when you're in a conversation with someone. I also think a lot of it is you start to lose your attention span if you don't consistently use it like anything else as a yeah. human. And that's why you see that these articles online give you how long it takes to read it. And, you know, TLDR, too long, didn't read. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God. You know, and I thought, oh, I will never be that. I was such a snob. I will <laughs> never be that. I will always read the 20 minute long narrative. Fuck that. <laughs> there are days that you get busy. And then I think that's the other thing that takes away from our ability to be present is, and I can only speak from a US citizen perspective of 24 seven, always on. And we're expected to be like that. And um, someone who's my mentor, he talked about in a, in a speech about how it's almost fetishized that we're not supposed to need anything. We're supposed to be hyper independent, especially for first responders, second responders, those who are in the health field. And then you add on top of it, the U.S. perception of you need to always be on. You always need to be available. There's no downtime just to enjoy your life. And it just speeds up. And the next thing you know, you're like older and you don't have as much anymore. And, and it could be physical, it could be financial, it could be medical that is impeding you from actually being able to participate in your life as the way you wanted to. 
mm-hmm. and it and it's gone. And it's just, it's amazing to me how people don't look up. I'll, I'll be in my car and I'll be driving somewhere. And I'm lucky I have a, an older vehicle that has a, a, a sunroof. And I'll pop that open and I'll have it open in a nice weather. And I'm at a stoplight and I just kind of look up just to check out the sky. And I see everybody is down on their phones or they're staring straight ahead. And that's it. Nobody's looking around. <laughs> nobody is Nobody is taking in where they're at at the moment. And I know some of the lights around in my area that take a long time to turn because they're in major intersections, sure. right? So I have a little bit of time to be able to monitor traffic, then keep looking up and see the birds fly by or the clouds or how pretty it is, some of the leaves that are going by, you know, or how pretty the fall leaves are. Nobody's looking. And I think that's the other problem that we have by not being present is that you don't, you don't see where you are in your life. And that, that can slip by pretty quick too. Gosh, there's so many things in that. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think, thankfully, at least what I'm seeing is numbers are kind of going against that trend now, which is why podcasts are so much more, have more credibility and audiences is sometimes people want real conversations like this one that last more than three seconds or Mm -hmm. 30 seconds or a minute for a real, they want to actually get to know somebody. And that's, to me, that's one of the honors I get to have is to, you know, each week sit down and really get to learn who somebody is and add a new friend to my friend group. Because I think, just like you said, at the end of our lives, that's what matters, right? That's what you go back to is what were the people like in my life and how did we impact each other? What did I learn? What did I teach? Mm -hmm. Not how much data could I generate in a day? Yeah. And a lot of persons though, I mean, it's about understanding where your privilege is too, is that there are some persons that don't have the ability because they don't have the resources or the time to be able to do those things because they're trying to make a living. They're working two and three jobs or one and two jobs. They're trying to raise a family or they may be the sandwich generation of taking care of their parents who are elderly and then also raising their kids and teenagers. And they're working a full-time job and they're trying to keep their relationship going. So it sounds easy to say, oh, nobody's looking up, nobody's paying attention. And there's going to be a lot of people who are like, fuck you. I'm just lucky if I can put one foot in front of the other, find my coffee mug in the morning just so I can get off to the races because I have so much I'm responsible for, so much obligation. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think it has to do with capitalism. You know, Mm -hmm. I want more. I want more things. I want Because there's a lot of generations behind us now that are saying, you know, not so interested in that, but they still have to work one or, you know, two to three jobs for some of them to afford just to live, you know, pay rent and utilities and it depends on where they're at and what they're doing, of course. And I'm, and I'm sure. trying, I hate talking in broad strokes like that, but for a lot of persons, it's about survivability and it depends on where they are and what they've been taught and what it means to survive, excuse me, got allergies to survive as well as enjoy their life. And I don't know. I mean, and then yeah. there's the, there's that other part too of me that is like, but there's also going to be sacrifice. No matter what mm-hmm. we do, there's going to be a payment that has to be made. And I tell yeah. my clients this all the time. Yeah. It doesn't matter the relationship. There's going to have to be a payment, emotional, physical, time, financial, sexual, whatever it may be. There's something that has to be given up to get the thing that you want or the thing that you're going towards. For yeah. me, I can work another job if I wanted to and have a really nice, big, fancy house. And number one, if I had those jobs, I wouldn't be able to live in that house and enjoy it. Right. Secondly, there are things that are more important to me. Having lived a life where I had to work two and three jobs to make ends meet because I wasn't highly educated. I wasn't able to pull the money in. I was single parent for most of my life. So I didn't have that opportunity to really just amass a lot of money. But now I'm at a point where I'm okay. I can make my rent. I can feed myself. I can, you know, pay my student loan. And I don't have any major outstanding debt outside of my student loan, thankfully. So I can say, you know what? I'm going to stick with just doing my practice that brings me enough money to pay for the basics and have a little bit left over to do my podcast because the bum isn't paying for itself yet. Right, right, right. (laughs) And but I'm not looking to get wealthy off the podcast either. I just want it to be there again to put information out. Yeah. But I'm willing to sacrifice the financial to have the time to do those things outside of my practice. Okay. Does that so make sense? I love it. I love it. It leads me right to this question. So hmm. to get there, 
to where you aren't in comparison mode, right? Because when I hear that, I hear, okay, this is this, Susan is outside comparison mode. She knows what she wants, mm -hmm. what she needs to get it, and she doesn't care. In your in your term, she doesn't give a fuck what everybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. So how do we get there? How do we get to that point where we say, I don't need to keep up with this neighbor or that neighbor? Because that's what, for a lot of people, especially we're talking in the U.S., a mm -hmm. lot of people here stay in that cycle, not because they want to be there. Like many of them I know want to get off, but because they stay in comparison mode, right? And they worry about what everybody else thinks if they step out of it. So how do how did you get the strength to not give a fuck? I got tired. Mm. Tired I got of what? Tired. Tired of everything. Yeah. Tired of working all the jobs. Tired of not having time. Tired of missing out on time with my relationships with my friends and my family. Um, I got tired of the bullshit of working two and three jobs and dealing with people who are inept at their jobs, usually higher above. Yeah. <laughs> I got <laughs> I got tired and I thought none of them are going to be there to help me as I get older and I want to do other things with my life. I'm going to be the one that has to do this. Mm -hmm. And luckily I had a really good therapist. She says, so what is it you want? And I said, I don't, I have no fucking clue. I have no idea. And so we started that exploration of what did it mean to be a grown up? And, and what, did, what did I grow up with? You know, family of origin informs you of how you need to be a human being from their perspective in your family. And then you're part of usually there's a religious or faith component that's in there. This is how you need to be to be part of this faith or this religion. Not all, but some. Yeah. And then it's about, okay, this is what it means to be a human being in the community. And that could be, we need to be wealthy. or We have to have the facade of being wealthy. You have to have all the things. Your kids have to go to the right school. You have to have the right education. You have to wear the right clothes. You have to do this. You have to do that. And when you start looking at the deeper part of it of who taught you that, okay, you find out who taught you that. Do you like doing that? Sometimes it's as simple as asking, do you even like doing that? Well, no, but I'm supposed to do it. Says who? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's always that pulling apart and getting deeper and deeper and saying, who taught you it? Do you still want to do it? What's the point of continuing to do it? Where do you see the benefit? And what is the payment you're making to get those things? And is it worth it to you? Hmm. I wish it was a simple answer other than, I you know, I was tired and I was, but it did lead to a much deeper conversation of why, where did that come from? Do I even want that anymore? Do I need to adjust it? Do I need to just get rid of it and come up with my own thing? Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question or not. No, I love it. I think it's a great answer. You got tired and you were asked. Thankfully, you had a therapist that asked you a, a very poignant question is, what is it you want? Because I think so many adults nowadays don't really know what they want. They're just doing because they're kind of on autopilot, right? Like, especially yeah. if I have a career or a job that's paying for that house that I always wanted, it's got the fence yard. I got the 2.3 kids or whatever we're down to nowadays. Mm -hmm. I have all the things you said I should have, you meaning society, but I'm not happy, but I'm just going to go through it because this is what I'm supposed to be, right? Like I'm not supposed to be happy. My parents weren't happy. Their friends weren't happy, right? We get in that, that deal. And I, so I think it's fantastic that you were asked, what do you want? And, and that's one of the things I wish we could do more of for people is to give them permission again to dream, right? Because you're 50 doesn't mean you shouldn't have a dream. You still got a lot of years left. Like, how are you going to live these? Exactly. You know, and this started when I was in my 40s. And that's when I decided that I also decided I was going to come out as queer because I had been all of my life. I don't, I don't remember a time that I wasn't. Sure. And I followed the path and pretended to be the heteronormative and it <laughs> did not work for so many reasons. <laughs> I, three marriages went down in flames. They did not go well because I was in those for the wrong reasons too. And just, I couldn't be myself. And just finally being able to say in your mid forties, I've had enough, I'm tired and I just want to be me. And I, and I just want to be me just to be a decent human being. That's, that's how it started for me. And what was that process like coming out? Oh, there? oh my God, Jared, it was so hard. It was, it hurt. It hurt so much. 
a lot of the time because you hold on to these ideas of who you are. And when you realize that's not who you are and you've been holding on to this thing and it's like, okay, but if I let it go, then I have nothing. At least I have this thing and it's something as opposed to if you take it away that allows you both arms to start using them to build this person who you really are and find what your options are and whether they work for you or not. It's painful to give up things that you have held close to your heart as the truth of who you are, because that's what you were told. That's what you were taught. That's what was reinforced. And we have to pull that apart. It's like, it's like taking the bandaid off, man. You got to, you rip that off. It's painful, but you know, sometimes in ripping the bandaid off, it's allowing that air to get in there and start healing some things. And that's kind of how I wait. That's what it was for me going through that process was healing a lot of bad shit and just things that just didn't make any sense. And why am I following rules that make no sense? They don't benefit anyone or they benefit people who already have so much. And it's like, I don't want to give you any more, you know, sort of like, that's why I went into my own private practice. You know, I, to be honest, you know, cause I also have problems with authority. Imagine that, (laughs) but, (laughs) you know, but also, you know, why should I give that to you anymore? You don't give a rat's ass whether I fulfilled at the end of the day or not. I'm just bringing in money to cover the bottom line. Yeah. Fuck that. I'm exhausted. I, I love the work that I do, but I can't do it in the way you want me to do it. So, you know, no, I'm out of here, you know, but it was also part of giving up that, the work ethos about this is how you're supposed to be in U.S. society and, you know, capitalism and the work world. And this is how it's supposed to be in the structure. And it's just, it was scary. There were plenty of nights that I laid awake and tried to figure out, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? How can I do this? And it also was scary and difficult to have open conversations with persons and be vulnerable Mm. because you come from the same background where you're in a helping profession. We're the helpers. We're not supposed to ask for help Sure. and being vulnerable. It means, well, they'll see me as less than if not weak, which is not true. Mm -hmm. And being able to have those open conversations, those honest conversations of saying, this is what I do. This is what I want to do. And I'm scared to death to do it, but I can't do it like this anymore. And having family and very close friends say, we got you. We'll figure it out. We got you. You've got to go and do the thing because we don't want to lose you because I was having health, serious health effects from where I was working in the ER and the stress being a crisis clinician there. And I I was going to say it was scarier for me to have those conversations with my family and friends than it was to be strapped to monitoring machines in the ER to see what was going on with me, if I was having a heart attack or not. And, you know, the heart attack, I knew what to do with that, but not knowing what I would do if my friends and family said, well, yeah, good luck with that. See ya. (laughs) Or, oh my God, you know, I don't know who you are and I can't trust you anymore. And I I don't love you anymore. And I can't accept you anymore because you're not this ideal of what I expect you to be. So it's hard. It's hard to go through that process. And I warn Everybody I know that wants to go through that process, yeah, you're going to have times it feels so fucking great. And you're going to think, why the hell didn't I do this sooner? You're going to have times you're thinking, what the fuck am I doing? This hurts so bad. And it, this is scary. And I don't want to do the thing, but I, I, I'm I, making progress. And, I, yeah. and in doing the thing, it's actually making other things feel less bad and, you know, the good stuff is off the charts. The hard stuff, it's it's down in the dirt and you're grinding, man. But give it, me, can you give me an example? It, can you give me an example of like what in that process is so high and then what on the flip side, what part of it is so low? Just obviously if somebody has never walked through it, I, I want to know in case I can support somewhere. Well, there's so many of them. Like when I came out of queer, um, it was scary that... I had to do the hard work of acknowledging that I was not what I was raised to be, which was a heterosexual female. I identify as cis female, but I am not heterosexual female. Right. I'm a pansexual. I I enjoy persons. I don't care what package they come in or what party favors they bring into the party. They are a human <laughs> being first to me. Yeah. And 
that took a lot of hard work to say that there's nothing wrong with me for being like that. And, and throwing away those things that told me through faith or religion and other persons in my life that tried to control my life because you're a kid, right? And you grew up and they throw all these expectations and you're told what's right and wrong. It's bad. It's evil. That was hard to get rid of because there's so much that you're afraid that maybe they're right. Maybe this is terrible and I'm a horrible person and everything. And, it, and it was seeing persons as human beings. That was really that hard work. And then seeing myself as a human being too, but then getting to the point where I just accepted myself for, Hey, I'm just Susan. I'm doing the best I can with what I got. I'm not here to hurt anybody. I just want to live my life as me. Yeah. The freedom. I could dress the way I wanted. I could wear my hair the way I wanted. I could have as many piercings as I wanted. I could get my tattoos. I could, I could go into a job that I really wanted to do instead of what I thought I had to do to fit in. I didn't have to date anybody that I didn't like just because it fit this mold of what I was supposed to be. And that was so freeing. That was so great. That's that's probably the pinnacle of the great part of working through the hard stuff and dry just grinding through that dirt to get to that point. Mm, fantastic. And it sounds like it opened up other, not, I don't want to say open your eyes to other things, but it, 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 let, it lets you step past and say, okay, if I'm making this big of a change, I'm going to make a change here too. And I'm going to change this. I'm really going to step into who, not just who I want to be in this realm, but who I want to be in life. Yeah. And, and it was sort of kind of interlaced with a lot of other things that are going on because once you start dismantling the coulda, woulda, shouldas, right? And how am I now? And you start developing that and building that, then it's like, huh, well then what about this thing about the job thing? I don't like doing that anymore, but there's nobody says that I have to stay there and retire from there and be miserable for the next 30 years. Fuck it. What am I going to do then? And that led me to going from an office administrator, office manager, admin assistant, to a counselor, a therapist. And that was scary because you were taking on student debt to do it because I didn't have that kind of money sitting around. And what scholarships and grants I could get covered a very minuscule part of it. So I took on the debt load to do it and then went into that new career for myself, which then opened more windows and blue doors open. I'm thinking I I would have never known that if I hadn't taken that first step of trying mm. to just figure out who I was. I love it. Yeah. And I think that's the momentum, right? We start creating small. And that's what I try to tell people all the time, create small change in your life. Mm -hmm. Small change creates momentum and all of a sudden it opens doors for other things. I think that's fabulous. And and I'm glad you stepped into it so I can know, know who you are. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm glad I stepped into it because I think I'd be dead by now. Um, oh, I either, definitely don't want that. No, you know, but it's, it's, unfortunately, it's one of those things too in people's lives that if they can't be who they are, either they take their own life mm. or they get to a point where their health is affected seriously and they die from complications of it. I mean, yeah, that was one of the main precipitating factors for me to go into private practice is Ending up in my own ER, strapped up to machines, trying to figure out if I'm having a heart attack or not. Man, I gotta find a different. I gotta find a different gig altogether because this is not working out. <laughs> Love the work, but everything else is too stressful. Yeah. So, yeah. What's been the uh, the biggest thing you've learned from your your work in therapy now? So you know, obviously, you went to a therapist, and and that inspired you to start making changes. Now you're giving mm -hmm. back in that realm. What would you say is the biggest thing you've learned? From which component the, in going through therapy or being a therapist, being able to give back, being a therapist in being able to give back. The biggest thing that I've learned is that over and over again, my belief in the power of the human experience to want to be a better human being is confirmed on the hour. Every hour I have a client every day that I, every single day that I meet a client, everybody is in there. Everybody I've ever met just want to figure out a way to stop hurting or being hurt. And they just want a life where they can be a good human being in terms of, of helping other people affect change in their life if that's what they need, 
or be there to support them as they figure some things out or figure out where they really want to go as opposed to where they think they need to go or they've been told to go. Mm. And the power of humans to be able to look inside themselves and say, oh, you know, there's some things here I really don't like about myself, but there's some things that, you know, I, I kind of like it. It's okay. And then being there and the trust they give me is so, I don't take it for granted. It is so important that they give me this trust to go along with them on that journey. And I don't know. I love it. I love that part of my belief in the ability to improve our human experience for ourselves and others keeps getting confirmed on the daily. Mm. I love that you said that for ourselves and others, because I think that's a hundred percent right. There's the more we give to others, usually the better we become. Mm -hmm. right? I agree. And we don't have to, we don't have to have this take mentality that is really permeated in the culture. A lot of times mm -hmm. you, I generally feel better giving more so than taking. And I think well, most people are that way, right? Well, they try to be, yeah. they try to be, but there's a lot about if I do the thing, how will I be perceived? Mm. And I'm one of those, I'm guilty of if I'm nice to someone, then I'm seen as a pushover, hmm. but genuine kindness can go such a long way when it's just, you want to be someone who's trying to think about maybe this person's just having a bad day. They're not a horrible human being, or they're not an asshole. They're just, maybe they're having a really rough day. I don't know them. And, you know, and, and they get snarky and everything else, like at the grocery store yeah. most recently for me, two weeks ago. And this guy was just being an ass. And this woman who was the cashier, she was keeping her cool through the whole thing. He was just, he was just horrible, he had bad temper and everything else. And he said something snarky to the, the cashier person and about something not being in stock or whatever. And it just happened to be on this end cap display aisle next to me. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, there's a couple here. Would you like me to hand you some? Nice. And I was just trying to be kind to him because it just seemed like he was having just a really shitty day. And I didn't want the cashier to have a bad day too, because of that. And he looked at me, he's like, what? I said, I happened to overhear you have the conversation that this item you were looking for. He said, it's, it's actually on sale right here. They got a couple left. Would you like me to hand you some? And this look on his face was like, uh, yeah. I said, okay, here you go. And he walked off and paid for his things, walked off. The cashier, I kind of know because it's a grocery store girl. Tell her. She goes, thanks. You know, she goes, he is just a handful. And I said, I wonder what's his story. Why yeah. is he so angry all the time? And she goes, I have no idea. So I went out to my car with my groceries and I hit his, hey, hey. And I'm like, oh man, angry man. <laughs> uh, uh, now I'm five nine and I'm a hefty girl and I'm not afraid <laughs> of anybody. And especially some of the shit I've gone through in the ER and lived my life. But so I shut the door after putting my purse in there, got the keys in my hand, turned around and said, yes, can I help you? And he said, that was really nice of you. I said, I'm... I just noticed that you were looking for some things. That's all. He goes, well, it's been a really kind of rough couple of days. And it was just kind of nice because I can take that home to my mom. I said, oh, I said, well, I'm glad I could help you. And then it just kind of spilled out about, you know, things have been going on. You know, I want to protect his privacy. So, you yeah. know, things have been going on and it was really rough stuff. And in the end, as I tend to do, I asked him, you know, where do you work at? And I'm like, oh, you know what? They have free counseling program through your workplace. I know that workplace. I said, it's called employee assistance program. And I said, you can just go and talk. You don't have to solve anything. You can just have somebody just listen. He says, well, I'm not crazy. I said, no, but if you don't talk to someone, it'll drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. And I said, and it's just somebody that's paid to work with you and just listen to what's going on. I said, you don't have to be suffering from a mental health illness because of whatever's going on to see this person is just about somebody's listening to you. And that's mm. all you need. And I don't know whether he'll ever follow through with it or not, because especially with males, they have a hard yeah. time going to somebody to talk to them. For sure. I hope he does though, because I mean, there's some really rough things going on for him, but you know, and I, and I just felt kind of better knowing that maybe this little glimpse in this day, maybe will give him some, that he may not act on it right away, but maybe in the near future when things get even harder, he may think, well, you know, what the hell? I'll go talk to the person at EAP and see what they have to say. But I'm not crazy. 
you know, yeah. fine, but just go and talk to them, you know, so I can only hope that it will help. And like I said, if that's the one person I help for that day that pays my rent on earth, I'm fine with it. That's all I care about. Mm, I but love that it. kind of genuine kindness. It's, it's hard because we get caught up in that defensiveness of protecting ourselves about, you know, you're an ass. I'm staying back here, especially if you're in a state that's, you know, concealed carry. You don't know what the fuck's going on. You, you want to stick back. But for most people, I think it's just the fact that they're having a bad fucking day or maybe a bad fucking week or hell, maybe a bad year. And it's just one thing tips them over. And I, I try more often than not to try to figure that out, you know, and see it maybe from that perspective. But I'll be the first to tell you that <laughs> I see some terrible things in my car when I'm driving people to make <laughs> these maneuvers on the roads. Like, where did you learn to drive? And yeah. Okay, I'm terrible about that. So, you know, what I, what I hear and, and what I what I love out of that is. Had you not leaned into who you were and stepped through those doors and become who you want it to be, which is the Susan I'm talking to now, would you have even had that conversation with this guy? Nope. Right. Right. See, and that's that's my point is when we step into who we were supposed to be. And, and by me, when I step into it, it means whatever it is you're supposed to do, whatever that dream is you're chasing, whatever that whatever it is. But on the flip side, when you give yourself grace to be imperfect. Right. When I accept, just like you said earlier, there's parts of me I love, man. There's parts of me I got to work on, but I'm okay because that makes me me. Then I'm more likely to have grace for the guy that's angry at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. more likely to offer help like you did because I know I would need help at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't count on anybody reciprocating the kindness. I just don't because that. Because that's the point of being someone who gives gifts of kindness is the fact that you just do it because you can. Doesn't mean you're going to get anything back from it. And I certainly don't expect to get anything back from it. But the fact that I can do it, I feel I feel I want to do so. If I can, yeah. why not? But I think we all get, always get something back from it, right? And, and here's what I mean by that is. Because you did that, maybe that's why the universe crossed our paths. Possibly. Yeah. Right. And, or maybe this guy goes out and then two weeks from now, he does get, go see somebody and it changes that. Right. Like it, it, we're mm -hmm. always going to get something back because we're putting good into the world. Yeah. I, I would love, I would love it if we had that ripple effect in the universe where the one good deed floats out to other persons and it, and it grows exponentially mm -hmm. in terms of, person's continuing to be kind to other persons when they need it most. But if we don't even try, we don't know if we will. Right. Cause I, I would agree. argue, I argue we do like, I'm going to leave here today and I'm going to be nice to somebody else. And you're going to leave and go be nice. Like, like we just doubled our impact. Yes. Yes. Right. And, I, and, and certainly I agree with you. There's no reason why I shouldn't try. There's no reason why we couldn't try. But, but I think what I want to, what I would love for people to get out of some of this is be graceful to yourself right like quit yeah. with the i gotta be perfect i gotta have stoicism i gotta nothing bothers me you mentioned males earlier right like nothing bothers me i power through everything i don't talk about anything i only have one feeling and that's pride at what i do right like yeah. i don't have anything else give yourself grace to be who you're supposed to be and that means tears and laughter mm -hmm. joy and sorrow right like we're supposed to yeah. feel all of this yeah. Sometimes that means being scared and being vulnerable and being soft. Sometimes that does mean being strong and stoic and, you know, powerful. It's, it's like you said, it's about trying to feel everything on, on that expanse of just being a human being. I, I think that's it. what's important. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I love about your story. When you said, wait a second, this is who I am. I'm done pretending I'm somebody else. You are, because it was ripping the bandaid off, like you said, that's because now you're feeling all the feels mm -hmm. instead of the compartmentalized. I'm only going to feel this way because it's what I'm supposed to feel. Yeah. And, and I think for all of us embracing that we're supposed to have all the things mm -hmm. is the first step in realizing like, okay, I'm having all these things. So maybe this bad day I'm having is just part of how I'm supposed to feel today. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, and I tell people feelings don't hurt you. The actions to the mm. feelings hurt you. Yeah. But it's not comfortable. Some of the feelings we have, even great joy can be very uncomfortable. 
for a lot of persons and yeah. it's, it's overwhelming. So I can see any, you know, too much of anything <laughs> is not always a good thing. Um, but you're right. We have the capacity to have all these feelings, but we put ourselves in these narrow little shoots of just, this is how it's just supposed to be. You know, all these other things, either they're too much or they're not relevant or they're not how I'm supposed to be. So I'm not, I'm not going to have those and just put the blinders on it. Just keep going. Oh, I love it. And, yeah, and you're right. I appreciate you said you read my book and you'll see like in that, I talk a lot about just trying to figure out who the hell I was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and thankfully there's just so many good people in the world that influence you. If you're open to being influenced and you're open to learning and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we were talking about age a little bit earlier, you know, when I hit 50, one of the things I realized, is I don't know a goddamn thing. I don't know anything like all the shit I thought I knew. I don't know anymore. So my kids sometimes now I'll be like, dad, what do you think on this? And I'm like, I got to tell you, I have no idea. And they're like, wait, what? Not a clue. <laughs> what happened to you? I'm like, I don't know. I just don't know anything. The older I get, the less I know. It's more fun living this way. <laughs> and it's nice because you, it's kind of like doing that info dump that you don't need any longer because it's just not relevant. So that it makes more space for the stuff you get to learn about now. Well, and I think yeah. that's what's exciting about it as well. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And it's just that curiosity of wanting to know other people's stories. And like we talked about, just being graceful to, hey, maybe I saw this person on their worst day. I don't know mm -hmm. what caused it, but I don't want to let it just carry me all day long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not only that, but I also helped to alleviate the stress of the person that was waiting on him. She, you know, she couldn't help him with what he was looking for because she's supposed to stay where she's at to do this job she has right. right and she can try and help him but he was just on this role and it's just like you know why wouldn't i want to intervene to alleviate what she's feeling too which is a lot of stress mm. I, I just feel that if i have the ability i i want to do that yeah yeah what would you say as we wrap up susan what would mm -hmm. you say a couple tangible tips for any of our community out there that still trying to step through that door of really living the life that they want to live? What are a couple of things you'd, you'd recommend? First one is look at the rules that you're following to see which ones are not working for you any longer. You know, if it's, I'm supposed to be this way, or I'm supposed to do that, or I'm supposed, you know, the coulda, woulda, shouldas, right? You know, I should be doing this, you know, um, someone would want me to do that, or, you know, I could be, you know, doing something else, but I have to do this instead. And basically saying those things that don't work anymore is fuck those rules. Love it. And then, honestly, if you're stuck, go see a therapist. You're, you don't have to be in crisis to see a therapist. There are so many different therapists for so many different reasons that you may want to go into someone and say, listen, you know, I don't have anxiety or depression or anything, but you know, I just don't feel like I'm living up to what I want to do in my life. And I would suggest checking with your employers. If you're in a place that offers employee assistance programs, and I'm sure that's what it's called across the state in the, in sure. the United States, but it, excuse me, again, my allergies um, with the employee assistance program, I think that's what it's called in most places, but it's where they, as a benefit, the employer gives to its employees counseling that's free. It is covered by HIPAA. That's the federal yeah. law for privacy. So nothing you say in there can be reported back to anyone, no one, unless you give them written permission to do so. Now, the caveat to that being, if you say that you have suicidal thinking or you have sure. plans for suicide or you want to hurt someone else, they have to supersede the federal law to get you to someone who can help you get stabilized and taken care of so that you can go back and have a better life outside of whatever the crisis was that brought you to that point. But otherwise, nobody gets to know anything about you. Just because your employer pays for that benefit, they don't get access to your records. They don't get access to the information that you and your counselor talk about. But you don't have to pay for that. That's paid as a benefit for you. Most places have that. So I would suggest checking into that. And then if not, just go online. And if you have insurance, check and see who your insurance covers for a therapist. It's sure. usually in your customer portal. You can go through and check that out. And that should help you kind of work through some other things that may be getting sticky and you're just not sure what to do. And you need an outside perspective to help you kind of guide, you know, maneuver around some stuff. So um, the other thing I would say is know who your support network 
who who is in your support network in terms of those are your right and die. Mm-hmm. You know, they they are the ones that you can go to and say, listen, I've been thinking about some things and I'm kind of scared about this, but this is what I've been thinking about. I want to do instead. What do you think? And they're not going to lie to you. They'll tell you that they're concerned that it may be disastrous for you financially or physically or medically or whatever. But more often than not, they're going to say, oh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And don't bounce ideas off of it for you. And then a lot of times I'll go, well, why the fuck not? Try it. Yeah. The worst, you know, what's the worst that can happen here? And you get to kind of think about it so you don't feel like you're alone in trying to say fuck the rules. I love it. I love it. Susan, thank you so much for joining us this week. Where, before I let you go, where can our audience follow you and become part of your community? Um, You can find me either on Instagram at the sweary therapist, or you can find me at fuck the rules podcast on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok at fuck the rules podcast and the sweary therapist. Um, You can find me online at cofeltcounselingservices.com. That's my business. I am only licensed to provide therapy services in Iowa and Illinois. And I provide services for those persons who are in the queer community, as well as for my folks that are in the first responder, second responder, emergent services, hospital, ERs, those staff members too. So that's where you can find me. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, Jared. (laughs)